Um, is this on? Yeah, now it's on. Um, I will be talking about the Salish Sea because I'm going to talk about a little bit north um, into Van or, uh, into the San Juans. Um, but the Vancouver Island stuff that I work on is off the west coast, so it's not a part of the Salish Sea. It's actually right off the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you get really very serious about it, you're talking about down around the Tacoma Nickel Bridge, there a bridge, and, uh, and so um, thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I'm going to take you're going to take that. Good. Oh, okay. okay. Excellent. Oh, actually, you're not. Oh, no, actually, yeah. Eleanor's <laughs> going to take it. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, I got a, a, which happens quite often, I, I get these emails like, hey, can you come talk to us about plastics? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I got, a, I got an email from Eleanor um, to um, do, come up here and to, to contribute my talk to your science um, forum. And then I got to meet her actually a couple weeks ago. So there was a plastic summit that we had down in Renton. So it was really exciting to, to get to meet her very briefly, but we got to meet each other and talk a little bit about um, um, what was would be appropriate for this um, group. So um, essentially, it, since you were at the science symposium or the plastic symposium, it's the same talk. Um, so if anybody saw, it, there's a video out now, I guess. So if you saw it, it's going to be pretty much what we'll be talking about today. I didn't um, put together data specifically for this location, but if I'm able to manipulate maybe the computer, I can show you a little map of some of the data points that I have from um, way up here. So this is where I work. This is actually, um, this is Commencement Bay, and hopefully we got a little laser here. Let's see if I can figure that out. I always go the wrong way. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so this is a few. Just, this is actually Commencement Bay, and if you go directly back into this area right here, um, well, actually, if we look up, that's Mount Rainier. Can you guys see it? That's pretty typical. You can't really see it. It's pretty cloudy. <laughs> you can kind of see the base. Even when I bring my students up there, I never see the, the peak. I don't think it really exists. Just kidding. Um, so anyways, uh, if you go straight back here, that's where the Center for Urban Waters is. It's on the um, Tacoma port. Um, and then just up the hill, about two miles away, is the University of Washington, Tacoma. So um, I do my... Uh, microplastics research at the, uh, at the Center for Urban Waters, and then I also teach environmental science at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Okay, so this here, right here, this is the Center for Urban Waters, and as you can see it's actually right between a bunch of oil tanks. Um, this is the um, Thea Foss Waterway, and this was a, a man-made waterway that was put in at the turn of a couple of centuries ago for import-export in the port. Um, and you can notice you can notice here that we have a beautiful little dock, and I get to like I look out my window, and sometimes I might see a gray whale, or I usually see quite a bit of seals. Um, but oftentimes uh, I'm able just to kind of get some work done, and then jump onto my dock and get on a boat. So about I typically sample early in the morning um, for the work that I do, and the reason is is because the sea state is quite stable. Um, so plastics, not all plastics, but the plastics that I was focusing on and I'm going to talk about and uh, focus on for this talk, um, float on the surface. So I need really flat water. Um, uh, if there's a lot of uh, wind and there's a lot of waves, there's a lot of mixing and it actually pushes that, the plastic bits down in the water column. So I'm the one that's up sampling at 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so this is me sampling. My friend was walking across the bridge at 7 o'clock going to a meeting up on campus, and she's like, oh, there's Julie. So she took this picture. I love this picture. So if you look way down at the bottom, all the way down here, you can see our teeny little boat. There's a little antenna. And this is this little manta net. It's a little manta ray uh, looking kind of a, you guys see it over here, um, a sampling very, very, very early in the morning. Now I wanted to just make a quick correction about what I do. I actually do study harmful algal blooms, and I work with folks actually in the same uh, same area, uh, Vera and uh, Stephanie Moore, uh, over in the same uh, uh, the building, <laughs> the same area that you guys work or that you work. Um, and so the plastics research that I do is pretty much for fun. Okay, it's what I do to help teach students, and I actually lead students through their research. Um, I don't know why this thing keeps slipping. Uh, um, I lead students through their research um, and teach them how to do the research through uh, plastics. 
And so this is pretty much what I do. So most of the work that I do and a lot of the data that I'll talk about it are on something called ships of opportunity. I'm out on a boat looking, uh, doing coring work throughout the Puget Sound, and I, I go to the captain, like, hey, can, do you mind if I sample for plastics as we're going from station to station? I'm like, yeah, no problem. And that's pretty typical in science, especially in oceanography. You kind of add more sampling opportunities. So why me and why do we care? Well, what I'll talk about today um, is plastics and the plastics problem. I'll describe some of the field and laboratory methods that we help to kind of refine at the Center for Urban Waters. Um, talk a bit about the results from 2008 to 2017. And then if we get some time at the end, I want to talk about some citizen science projects and, and challenge you guys or actually welcome you guys to maybe uh, join some of our monitoring um, for beach plastics here up in your region. Okay. So why, why the University of Washington Tacoma? Well, we hosted an international conference in 2008 at the University of Washington, um, trying to figure out what we knew about plastics pollution and what we didn't know about plastics pollution. And the group that um, um, sponsored it was NOAA's Marine Debris Program out in Maryland. And we brought together a bunch of international folks uh, to talk about what we know and what we don't know. So, Pretty much what the outcome of that meeting was is that we didn't really have a good standardized method for, um, for collecting plastics in the ocean, and also we didn't have standardized methods for analyzing plastics back into the lab. Um, the biggest thing that came out of this meeting was um, basically the working definitions of what microplastics are. So if you read any article or if you hear a talk, this definition actually came from this meeting. This working definition for plastics or microplastics specifically is anything that's less than five millimeters. Okay? So it's a bit about the width of a little skinny pencil. Okay? Anything smaller. Uh, and that's what we came up with in this meeting. And we also came up with a lot of questions. Lots and lots of questions. Um, and lots of hypotheses that we wanted to kind of tackle before our next meeting uh, a couple years later. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> so let's define plastics a little bit. Um, so plastics are any solid that are comprised of pretty much polymers. So carbon and hydrogen bonded together in a solid form. Okay, they can be many different, they can have many different physical properties. They can be hard, they can be soft, they can be green, they can be pink, they can be clear. Okay. And then we borrowed um, the group that, uh, during that meeting, we borrowed this kind of concept from pollution, pollution and more uh, atmospheric pollution, is the idea is a primary versus secondary pollution. And so we would define primary plastics as anything that has been manufactured for that use. So that would be like the face, uh, like the face scrubs, the plastics in your toothpaste. These here, do you guys know what these are? Beads. Nurdles. I love to say nurdles. I think it's just a fun thing. But they're, they're micro beads, right? Or these are the beads. Um, they're also formerly would call, be called a pre-production plastic pellet. There was a gal that I used to always come to the meetings and she'd go, excuse me? Those are pre-production plastic pellets because she was from, you know, the, uh, she was from Texas. Uh, so she used to talk about these, uh, these plastic pellets. Um, so those are pre-production plastic pellets. Secondary plastics are anything that used to be a big piece of plastic that's been broken down into smaller bits. And these are probably more common than I see when I work in the Puget Sound or more specifically the Salish Sea. When I'm out on the coast, though, I actually see more of these pellets. I do see pellets here in the Puget Sound, or these nurdles, um, but mostly I see these uh, secondary kind of broken down pieces of plastic. Okay. So also from that meeting, we had a, a discussion about size classifications. And again, we we're just borrowing um, terms that already exist. We were trying to come up with methods and ideas so that we weren't reinventing the wheel. We didn't have to make new instruments. So um, we came up with these ideas or size classifications. And I'll, I'll claim that nanoplastics, that's all me. But I, I'll still talk about that um, quite a bit. Um, or actually, not quite a bit, but I'll, I'll mention why. So megaplastics, if I am out teaching citizen science about plastics and we're doing beach sampling, uh, and usually they're kids. But you know, it's about something that's a little bit bigger than the palm of your hand. 
Okay, so anything that's bigger than the palm of your hand. Macroplastics would be anything that was the size of a pencil and about the palm of your hand. Um, microplastics is what my focus is, is anything that's um, thick as a pencil to a pin, so a thin pin. So think about plastics and microplastics. It kind of implies that you can't see them without a microscope, but you can. You can see these bits. Um, and they basically kind of look like this, okay? Now, why 330 microns, why 0.33 millimeters? Because those are nets that we have in our field room. So if you talk to any oceanographer, they're going to have a 20 micron net, they're, they're looking for phytoplankton. They're going to have an 80 micron net because they're looking for zooplankton. They'll have a 30, 30 micron net also. So we weren't trying to create anything new, um, but that's the, um, the net that we use. They're actually the mesh of the nets, okay, so the holes that are in there. And then nanoplastics is anything that would go through those holes, okay? So when we talk about the face scrubs and the microbeads uh, or in the toothpaste stuff, I don't find that, okay? I don't find that in my field samples, okay? That stuff would just go right through the, the net, okay? So we basically came up with a hypothesis, and then I want to back up a, a little bit about my preamble to this talk, is that a lot of this work is done by undergraduates and graduate students. I just get to look good. I get to come out here and get a piece of pizza. You know, I get to meet cool people. But really, a lot of this work was done by um, students. And sitting around and really developing these ideas and this, this, this work, through a series of scientific method ideas. So it's really kind of cool. So our hypothesis, or what our task was, is, well, actually, I'm going to back up just a little bit. After that first meeting, basically, someone from NOAA came up to us and said, Julie, um, can you find out how much plastic's in the ocean? <laughs> no. But what they really were asking is that we kind of develop some of these ideas and methods that we can share with people all over the world um, and try to standardize the way in which we collect, um, or we actually study microplastics in the ocean and also in the laboratory. So our task then was to quantify um, certain types of microplastics, and most specifically we're looking at polyethylene, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, and then there's that, what's that one piece of plastic that you always find over every, styrene, polystyrene, right? So we also added polystyrene. So the other three that I mentioned are the ones that are, uh, have the greatest amount that's being manufactured in the world today. It's the most commonly used plastics. But we add polystyrene, of course, because it's something that we always see in the ocean environment. So almost, almost every sample, or even when you're out in the boat, you can see these little bits of polystyrene floating, floating around. So certain types of microplastics, anything that ranges between the width of a pencil and the width of a pin, and specific locations in the ocean. My focus has been looking at um, plastics on the surface. We know that plastics can exist on the beaches. Plastics exist in sediments, seafloor sediments. And they also can not only float on the surface, but they can live within the water column. They actually can have a neutral buoyancy. Okay, but my focus and what we'll talk about today is just the stuff that's floating on the surface. And I just wanted to kind of point out, you can kind of see, it's a little bright in here, but you can see all these little bits of things in here. All of these white bits are actually plastic. Does anybody know what these black bits, and I'll give you a little hint, this came from the Chesapeake Bay. Not oil, but close. What's hard oil? That's no, no, it's not oil. <laughs> Do you know what it is? What's a black bit? And actually, it's powdery. It's coal, right? I remember getting these samples from the East Coast. I, I've only worked in the Puget Sound in oceanographic research, and so I'm like, what is this stuff in here? And, and coal in samples that come from the Chesapeake Bay is kind of normal, coal bits and coal dust, because that's how they do their energy, right? We don't have that here. And so I was really surprised. I'm like, what is this? And I thought it was plastic, and it's powdery, and... Anyways, I digress. So that's what the black bits are. But the white bits, we did find were pieces of plastic. Okay? So we had another workshop a couple years later um, when we first opened the Center for Urban Waters. And we basically came back and we all decided we still don't have a standard practice for sampling and actually 
quantifying and doing laboratory analysis uh, throughout uh, in international circles. And even to this day, even at the Plastic Summit, talking with the people that I was presenting with um, a couple of, about a month ago, um, we still kind of disagree how we, uh, in ways in which we will, um, we actually analyze the samples. So the field sampling, that's pretty standardized, but we still have issues with respect to, to an analysis in the lab. Okay, so let me tell you what I think is the best way to analyze samples. <laughs> All right, so this is um, the field method that we use. And um, when I first started thinking about, so how are we gonna sample plastics out in the field? And I do lots of boat work. I'm always out collecting water samples and I'm coring and all that kind of stuff. How am I gonna collect these water samples? So I went into my, my um, field room and I got this plankton net that was 330 micron mesh. So the holes in between were about the width of a pin. Okay, it was attached to this big metal stainless steel ring. Okay, had a bridle on it. And then I was like, okay, I've got to sample the surface, so I'm on a boat and I can get it to move, so I'm gonna move it across the water, so I just need to go at a certain speed and I can sample at the surface. So that was cool. So the, the boat that I used, or was using at the time was a jet boat um, for the city of Tacoma. It only goes fast or slow, right? <laughs> so, so I'm in the back of the boat. It's not that big, but I was in the back of the boat. It's kind of loud and stuff like that. And I set the net on. I'm like, go ahead, Tony, go ahead. So he goes, and, and you know, he's in a jet boat. He doesn't know what I wanted. So, so he puts it full bore, and then the net jumps over the, the boat. So, okay, okay, that was too fast. Tony, let's go a little bit slower. So then, you know, then we were in, if you know anything about a jet boat, they only go fast or slow. So you can't go medium. You can't, they either go fast or they don't move is basically how they work. So then it was like, okay, go, go ahead and, you know, go a little bit slower. So he went too slow, and the net was sinking and so I'm like go faster go slower and it was just this crazy nut job thing it happened for two sampling days and I'm like forget it Tony's like you need to figure this out so I went to Noah's website and I looked up how do you how do they sample on um, the surface they use something called a mantinet and the mantinet the plans that I found were had a 10-foot wingspan okay it was really heavy okay so what I did is I, I went to my dad and I said hey dad he owned an aircraft repair shop at that time and he said I said can we can we figure out how to make a better mantinet and he's like yeah so this is actually fashioned after um, wings that he would manufacture at his shop um, this is all aluminum okay and he says that if I put it out in the water I could stand on it, it would still float I didn't try that, <laughs> but anyway, so we came up with this mantinet, and so this thing basically, you can go as slow as you want, um, and it actually does a really nice job at sampling at the surface. This um, particular picture is up in Glacier Bay in Alaska, so this is my buddy Wally. He wanted to borrow my net because he was taking his yacht up there. I'm like, yeah, sure, get me some samples. And all this stuff, this crud in here, that's all plankton. He brought me back a pretty stinky set of samples to process after he got back. So anyways, we came up with this, um, with this sampling method. We collect solids from the upper 0.2 meters of the water column. Um, this custom uh, fabricated manta net um, was developed. Uh, we tow between about three to four knots or so for about five to 15 minutes. 15 minutes was like, we're sitting in a room like, mm, 15 minutes sounds good. But sometimes you might collect some material um, that basically clogs that net and it starts to sink. So that's why there's a variation in time. Um, and then we sieve it in the field for, uh, between um, 0.33 microns and five millimeters. And then we transport it back to the lab on ice. Okay, this is what a typical sample would look like. A lot of um, slimy uh, eel, eel grass and um, lots of organic material we typically would see. This sample is actually from Clackwood Sound, which is on the east or the west coast of Vancouver Island, right off Tofino. And then we sieve, and this is really early in the morning. Get my students out, let's go. <laughs> let's get some work done, doing some sieving. And every single piece of eel grass we actually clean off with a, uh, with a filtered uh, uh, seawater. Okay, and these are what our samples look like. So if you look kind of close, I'm a little bit closer here and I'll, I'll flip over, but you can see pre-production plastic pellet. There's a nurdle there, okay? There's a nurdle right there. There's plastic bits, so there's quite a bit of plastic. This one came, let's see if I can find the nurdle for you guys over here. Nurdle, nurdle, some plastic bits throughout. This came from um, Chesapeake Bay, but um, I just want to say that even though this came from a 
an area that's way more populated than the Puget Sound, we still see something like this that's very similar here in the Puget Sound. Okay? And not only do we see this, these concentrations in like our urban areas, but we also still see them in less urban areas. Why? Because water moves. <laughs> water does move. And in fact, when I compare the concentrations from the Puget Sound to like, um, you know, the San Juan areas and even looking off of uh, the West Coast Island and Clackwood Sound um, of West Coast Vancouver Island, um, the concentrations are still pretty similar of plastics. Okay. I don't know if that's a good, good news or bad news. Now, I'd like to show this slide to everyone so that you guys can see what the variability of the samples look like. So notice here it's got a lot of uh, woody debris. There's some um, grass clippings. There's plastics. Um, there's plastics that actually aren't floating <laughs> that are at the bottom of the sample here that it got off the surface. So these, all four of these samples came from the same location on the same day. So I was hosting one of those conferences, and I would take out um, the, the participants four times. And so I would go out and we did the exact same location. And when we came back, we actually saw that there was a lot of variability in the solid material that we collected in our samples. And I think that's really important to note. So when people are talking about concentrations of plastics, and there isn't a whole bunch there, well, maybe there isn't a whole bunch of solid material you know, that's in that uh, area in the first place, okay? But after maybe a, a, a storm, tides, winds, those concentrations are going to change, okay? I'm not going through this whole slide. But what we do is we, when we get the uh, samples back, this one actually was in the cooler for too long, so you can imagine what that smelled like. <laughs> it was pretty gross. But anyways, we take it back and we sieve it again just to rinse off all the slimy stuff. Um, we put it through a wet peroxide oxidation to basically get off the biofilm, off the material. A lot of plastic is found in areas uh, in which there's an aggregate of material because things get stuck in seaweed, okay, stuck in and, uh, lots of mats of stuff or material that's floating on the surface wet peroxide oxidation, and then um, we put it in a density separator. The stuff that's at the bottom of this cone here is like sand and rocks. I found a brick in one of my samples. Now, think about this, right? So I, I actually collect from the surface. So there's actually a lot denser material that actually float in the surface just due to the movement of water. Um, and then after we're done with all of that, we drain it out, and then we just pick. We pick each of the individual pieces of plastics. Um, and you can see here I'm wearing uh, headphones because there's lots of, um, lots of loud music just to keep you from going, not going insane. And when people come into the lab, they're very careful about you know, coming around because I can't hear a thing. They don't want me to kill them with my, my tweezers. <laughs> and then we just put them in these little vials. Um, and this is what we typically get. So some people like to ask me, well, how much is that? Well, average average, the amount of water that would get me this much plastic, this is Puget Sound and this actually is Chesapeake Bay, but again we could flip these, okay, it's about um, half the volume of a swimming pool in your backyard, so like a hotel swimming pool, small one. That's a lot of water, right? And these are averages. Now sometimes I get a lot more, but these are averages for the amount of plastics that we get um, in the samples that I've been uh, collecting since 2008. Okay, so let me talk to you briefly about um, some of the results, the survey results. So I always need to talk, give everybody credit, because if I calculate how much time it takes for me to pack up my equipment, get it on a boat or a ship, do the sampling, take everything back to the lab, rinse off my stuff, it's like three to five hours per sample. It's a lot of time. You know, and we batch it, you know, we do a lot of sampling um, when we can, um, but I can't do it by myself. So I have a lot of people that I work with. And so these are some of the people who I've collaborated with and continue to collaborate with. Um, I have Tacoma Community College, Bellarmine Prep, it's a high school uh, age preparatory school in Tacoma, North Seattle Community College. I have to, <laughs> they're kind of funny. They're like, hey, can we put, can we drag your net behind a, a kayak? Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and 
so they actually didn't do very well. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was really, it was not very good. But they, they wanted to get out in kayaks in Lake, uh, Lake Union and, and do some sampling. So they got like two samples or something. Um, I'm doing some work at the Seattle Aquarium looking at the influent and the effluent. Um, from, or actually not the influent. So I'm looking at the influent that's coming from the Puget Sound, going through the filtration system and looking at pre and post filter before the plastic, or excuse me, the water gets into the aquarium. Jason Lee Middle School, they're doing some beach plastic monitoring for me, and I'll show you some more details about that in a bit. NOAA's Marine Debris Program. I work with a group that isn't active on the boat base anymore, but they used to have a big boat called the Indigo. I don't know if you've ever seen it um, floating around in, um, in this area. But there's Sea Education Adventure. It's not the Woods Hole folks. These guys are out of Vancouver or Whidbey Island. Um, and they used to do some boat based education. So you, they collected a ton of samples for me in 2012. Um, what I'm most proud of is the partnership they have with Sound Experience. And so this is the Adventurous. Has anybody ever been on the Adventurous here? Yeah? Couple, that's great, oh, awesome, yeah. So I'm actually, um, I have a partnership, I'm on the board and, I, and I'm in charge of their environmental education committee. Um, and so they actually go out as a part of the rotation, right, and they, they actually will collect some of the samples using a manta net that they got uh, donated to them by Ben and Jerry. So they went and they, they really supported that, um, that uh, the equipment and, and the vision for sound experience, and I think that's kind of cool. And then we get ice cream every once in a while. Plus, pretty fun. <laughs> I think it's really awesome. So they actually do a lot of sampling presently um, t um, and continue to support the research. And then the most recent collaboration with the Washington State Department of Ecology, they monitor sediments throughout the Puget Sound. And as I mentioned, I'm a geologist, specifically a sedimentologist. I'm not sure why I'm on a boat, but because <laughs> I look at sediments. And so I actually am looking for plastics in the sediments as a, uh, a possible place where the plastics are going, so as a sink um, for the plastic pollution. So this is, this is an older map, but you can kind of see uh, the extent in which I sample throughout the Salish Sea specifically. So I've got uh, one sample here in Victoria Harbor. I get some in the Strait of Juan de Fuca when I'm on my way out to the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I do um, sampling in um, the San Juans and up in this region here, and then down in um, Puget Sound and, and Hood Canal. Notice there are some samples that are here on land. Those are some teacher workshops where, again, teachers are like, can we, can we test it off of this little, uh, off the Puyallup River? And I'm like, yeah, let's try it. Let's see. So we unfortunately found plastic. What's the difference between Oh, good question. So the blue is actually um, the, sound, the, the sea folk. So it's this, um, that was the first boat-based education group. The pink is um, not, it's not updated, but that's what the adventurous has collected for me. So that's, and then the, the goldenrod color is where I actually do research. So those are some places where I sampled. And it's actually quite, it's filled in quite a bit since I, I created this map a while ago. Yeah, but that's what the three different colors are. Great question. Okay, so results. We have to look at a graph because, you know, that's kind of fun. So, yeah, so you can see here, um, I wanted to be very clear about the, the numbers of samples in which we've collected. So, um, you know, 2015, I only had about eight samples. 2016, I'm still kind of going through um, those. And this is only a report on four samples from 2017, though we've got lots of um, samples in process. So this, where you see the larger numbers is where we had, you know, a, a lot of effort going into the plastic sampling. Um, but the averages still kind of uh, come out. So I just I wanted to show you guys um, very simple statistics. Minimums, you know, I used to until 2010 say that I've always found plastics in every single sample that I've ever collected ever. But um, as I continued sampling, there were some zeros. So we got zeros in here. And it, even these ones here, there's actually very little. So very little amount of material. Um, Oh, and let me back up too. So the way this is, um, this graph um, is what what this graph is showing you. This is a minimum, maximum, average amount of plastics. But if you notice here on the y-axis, this is looking at microplastics mass per dry mass. So it doesn't have anything to do with how much water I collected. It just has everything to do with how much dry mass was actually in 
uh, you know, floating on the surface. And so I'm comparing how much plastic to dry mass, okay? Which is different than how people um, report. And when I write papers, I actually do it the way they want to with numbers per volume, but it, to me that doesn't make any sense. But I, I report both ways. But for this, I just wanted to very clearly show that this is microplastics mass per dry mass, so the, heart, the solid stuff that's in, floating on the surface of the water. So for the maximum, some of the, <laughs> these are in uh, parts per thousand. So the maximum here is this big one here, and that's about 56% of the dry mass was plastic. I found a big chunk of plastic in a whole bunch of organic material, or natural organic material. Okay, so that's not to kind of make you, you know, be, don't be too alarmed. It was just I found a big chunk of plastic, okay? Um, and so that's, this is about, I don't know, 43%, 42%. So these are the maxes. You can see, though, if you look at the averages over the years, that they are about less than 10%. Less than 10% of the average amount of plastics that we find in the solid material floating on the surface in Puget Sound and Salish Sea specifically um, is less than 10%. Thank you. Okay. Got to show our box plots. So again, the box plots here, by time, same. Uh, we're actually still looking at the microplastics mass per, per dry mass. Um, these box plots here, the bigger the boxes, means I collected a whole bunch more samples. Each of these dots would be considered outliers that have been confirmed. So these are some times where I found just a big chunk of plastic. Um, that was going to be just a little bit different than what um, statistically would be within these box plots. But as these box plots are overlapped, this kind of tells you a little bit of a story. We don't see an increase, nor do we see a decrease in the amount of plastics in just the short time that I've been sampling at Puget Sound. Okay? Just goes up and down. Yeah. And it doesn't really have much to do with how big these box plots are. We're just looking at these average lines here. Um, we don't see an increase nor a decrease. So maybe that's good news, maybe it's not. And what I love about plastic pollution is that we have the solution. Use less plastic, right? Throw your stuff in the garbage, you know? Figure out better ways to dispose. I think the pollution issue with respect to plastic is kind of some good news. We can take action and we can make changes. So that's kind of cool, or at least I think. Or else it's going somewhere else. All right, so um, I just, oh, you always have to thank who uh, paid for all this stuff. So uh, NOAA's Marine Debris Program, of course, JASEO, which is a, a partnership between uh, NOAA and the University of Washington, paid for everything. But I always have to show the folks, like, again, I didn't do anything. I just get to talk to you guys, get to hang out on Saturday, eat some pizza. But these are all the guys. These are freshmen. These are freshmen. I get to teach this class called Plastic Pollution in the Ocean. That's so cool. I'm just the luckiest person. I get to teach this class, and I get to kind of um, get freshmen out there looking at plastic ocean pollution. Um, and, you know, they're all just super excited. They're fighting over tweezers and stuff like that, and they're really motivated to really understand more about plastic issues here in the Puget Sound. So this is the Center for Urban Waters, and out there is the waterway. But that's exciting. And, you know, this kid, he just, he's going into, he's, he's becoming a doctor, She's, she's working in the state senate. This kid's going to med school. That's so cool. And they always remember, oh, you're the plastics gal, you know, so it's kind of fun. All right, so do we have just a moment? How are we doing? Okay, yeah, this, this will be pretty fast. So um, one of the things that I've done um, for outreach and citizen groups and, and teaching kids, and I think it's easier to do beach work than it is to get folks on boats, you know, just time and money and and issues, but, but a lot of people like to do beach cleanups. It sounds like you guys are already doing surveys, and so this is just something that um, I borrowed from um, the Point, no, the Port Townsend Marine Science Center. Um, they did this bid monitoring outreach um, a couple of years back, well, actually almost probably been about eight to nine years back. Um, and so I've used and modified their method to actually do some monitoring of beach plastics. I know, it's a hard one. <laughs> okay, so this was paid by the NSERC, which is like, that's Canada's uh, NSF, essentially. And the, the focus was a bunch of women scientists, so Audrey Dallimore and Leslie and Laura, these guys are all from um, Canada. And then below here, and it's kind of dark, I, um, we have um, Cheryl Greengrove and myself. And this is me on uh, a beach in the Ahoset Village. Uh, with a bunch of students from the Wiccanish, no, 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 these guys were from the, 
I'll, it's on the next slide, I'll, I always pronounce it incorrectly, but you can see these students here, and this is actually on their beach. This is one of those canoes that they row over here. It's so cool. And this is where I get to work. This is Clackwood Sound. And, and um, they started, we basically went to um, this village to teach students how to monitor their beach plastic. Um, so, so this is David and Xavier. These kids kept switching hats and sweatshirts and stuff trying to teach trick us to who was who. This is one of the, the adults, the elders. Um, and this is the uh, uh, Mactusis, that's right, Mactusis School. Annie Broadhurst from the East Coast of, of uh, um, Canada is an import. And she, 16 students and elders were out sampling beach stuff. So this is one of the transects that we we're going through. Um, they sampled three locations on their beach. Um, and they're going to continue sampling. They've committed to continue sampling and going to different beaches. Perfect. Yeah, we're in great shape. Um, they're going to be sampling beaches throughout their island um, and, and to contribute to this new beach monitoring program and this consortium that we're setting up. So this is Juniper right here. This is Diamond. They're hot shots, man. They are the smartest gals, and they were just like, answering questions and keeping all the guys in line because everybody was trying to show off. This is my buddy Lennox. He had to dig a hole, okay? But he's one of those kids who digs a hole and you ask a question, he's like, he answers it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He knew all the answers. He just needed to be digging holes. Um, and so this is Stanley. Stanley memorized all those numbers for the macro versus micro just by looking at it for a moment. These kids are great and amazing. This is the village. We were actually leaving to get back to Tofino and they're still on the beach sampling. Um, we partnered up with the Surfrider organization, and they're kind of an activist group, but they have really great, excited um, contributions to environmental issues. And so they were doing macro plastics work, um, which we um, left a kit in our procedure with the Surfriders also, so they can continue doing um, beach plastic monitoring on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Okay. We also worked with a group of students called the Wiccanish Community School um, with Mrs. Uh, Melanie Morris. She had 20 students. This is my buddy here. He was collecting cigarette butts. He was so cool. He's like, can we do some data collection? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So this is my buddy here. And these, these kids were so excited. And then we also had a, group, a gal from the Raincoast Education Society working with us. Okay. So again, these, these tweezers, these guys were fighting over tweezers. Are you done yet? Is it my turn? They were so excited. It was just really ex it's thrilling. And so this is a different type of beach. This is out of Tofino. Um, but everybody was really engaged. And they actually helped me kind of um, improve my sampling technique um, so that they can actually uh, sieve more, more material. So that was really neat. OK? So here's where I just a little, maybe if you guys are interested, is we have this new mapping network where everybody reports. This is just a Google form. I'll increase some. I'll make it a little bit more formal. But this is a Google form in which they, these groups are reporting data. And so we got people from Vancouver Island. I work with teachers throughout the South Puget Sound. And we're actually creating this beach plastic monitoring map. Okay? And so um, you basically contribute. I put a point on the map. I report your data. And then you can con connect and contact or connect with other people throughout the region. So this is something kind of fun, super easy. The kit for monitoring is less than $100. It includes a lot of plastic, but, but it's actually quite, uh, <laughs> I know, isn't it funny? Yeah, it's quite funny. Um, but um, definitely is something that if you're interested, um, get with Eleanor, and she can get you in contact with me, and I'll set you guys up. We just need a champion um, to do that. So this is off of, this is Tofino still. I love Tofino. And this, this mud flat has kind of got a silly little story, but you have to look up the, the wild cows of Tofino. There's a bunch of cows that were brought in here, <laughs> domestic cows that nobody takes care of, and you actually see them walking up and down these beaches. They're, they're kind of interesting, little feral cows. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So that's all I have for you. Questions? There's a microphone coming around. They want you to use that. Yeah. So you've been talking about these microplastics. What about the, uh, what was the nanoplastics? The nano, yeah, that's so, um, gosh, there's so many different projects that I'm working on. But the nanoplastics, 
These are those face scrubbers. These are the, the toothpaste things. And when I do my sampling, I don't see them, you know? And even when people look in effluent from wastewater treatment plants, we don't see them. But you know that, I mean, I had them in, I was using that toothpaste and I was unaware until my dentist is like, there's blue stuff in there, you know? And I'm like, oh, I should know better. But, but you know, you own it for seconds. It goes to down the drain and it does not get filtered out of the wastewater treatment plant. There's nothing that would filter that stuff out. Because <laughs> I find that too, when I comb my hair, I find that my, my brush has all this weird fluff in it. My friend, I hate microfibers. Yeah, but I that's the new fibers. focus, and everybody's super excited about microfibers. So now I've got to start looking at them. But here's the deal is I'll go out sampling, and then I keep what we call just a passive filter. So I take a petri bit dish, and I put the same filter that we're looking at doing the analysis. And I just put it just right by my lab bench. And this is the clean lab. And every day I go through that clean lab, hair's up, we're wearing all cotton, you know, and everything's really clean, and I find six microfibers that came from somewhere, you know. And so without, you know, you need a positive pressure room, and even that, I still found fibers. So I hate fibers, but I'm figuring it out, and I'm looking at it. And, and now there's a big shift with my research students looking at the Puyallup River watershed, because we're right there, and, we're look and that's what we're finding are the fibers. And so even with that careful QAQC and making sure we have blanks to, to make sure our data is really good, we're still seeing fibers, you know. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but we've been doing it the whole time. And, and here's the issue with, and I'm so glad that you did this talk. I wish you could, like, be before my talk all the time. But people talk about plastics and hurting fish and stuff like that. The, the fish, they eat it, they poop it out. What they're probably getting, you know, with the exposure to these 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 chemicals is probably swimming in the water, you know? And so, um, so we've been eating, you know, stuff that, I mean, how many folks have eaten plastic before, right? And how many folks have, you know, gotten sick and died? You know, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's always been there. Um, and yeah, I just don't know that. And the, the research is very active trying to understand, like, what is the, what is the effect of us eating plastic? You know, what does it do? Well, Maybe not a whole lot, you know, maybe not a whole lot. It's, it's the other things. Um, and then, you know, they, uh, a lot of the fabled kind of ideas is that there's bioaccumulation, right? The shellfish, the plankton's eating plastic. Well, they're probably pooping that out. And then, and then the, the fish eat the plastic, well, they're pro or to eat the, the, um, the plankton. They're probably pooping that out too, right? And, and, you know, we do find whales with bags in them, you know, and that's really sad. That's not what killed the. That's not what killed that whale, right? So it's 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 a it's a tricky thing. <laughs> it's very very tricky. Yeah, yeah. I get in a lot of trouble for saying that. And now I'm going to be in more trouble. It's getting <laughs> recorded. Yes. You know, a couple of questions. Uh, when you answered one about wastewater treatment plants, mm -hmm. uh, the wastewater treatment plants are are uh, uh, the source perhaps of the turtles and the nanoplastics and the litter and the larger stuff. Exactly. So how many folks make coffee this morning? How many folks scooped a little bit of coffee and got a couple of grounds on your counter a little bit? Right? Right? And so anytime you have transference, so these are little bits of things. And so think about in a manufacturing plant, you know, the tubs that, that we put these nurdles in, these pre-production plastic pellets are probably maybe as big as this room. And anytime you take it from the collection or the creation site to the storage site, you, you spill a little. Okay, and you and I walk around, we stick to our shoes, we take out to the parking lot. And then it goes into the train car, and then it goes from the train car to the manufacturing plant that uses it. So anytime there's transference, you're going to lose a little. Okay, and the industry, they've cleaned up their act quite a bit. It used to be really messy, and now they're trying to keep it clean. But I drive to my lab, and I see um, uh, trains, cars, filled with pre-production plastic pellets with stuff all over the railroad tracks because they're digging it out, right, with whatever method, right? And so water's going to pick it up and bring it out to the water. So every time there's transference, and imagine having those big train, or those uh, trailers on a boat, and they fall off the boat, you know? So that's probably the source. I think it's getting better according to the plastics industry. They have this new, um, well, you know, they, they do research too, but I just wanted to, yeah, just put that out there. So yeah, that's probably where the nurdles are coming from. So Yeah. 
Yeah, and they feel that they've done a really good job at really, you know, doing that. So that's where the nurdles are coming from. Wastewater treatment plants, so the work that we're doing, and we're just like really basic. We're um, sampling uh, above and below wastewater treatment plants on the Puyallup River watershed. And we don't, we find more upstream. So we're not sure. And we're, we're just like, we just started. Um, but there's some people, and there's probably only about 10 papers throughout the world that claim that it's all coming out of the wastewater treatment plant because they find a bunch of fibers here. But then there's more papers that come out that say they find fibers upstream from the wastewater treatment plant. So I don't know if we figured that out yet. Yeah. The other question I had, if I may. Yeah. Um, Plain time. Mm-hmm. Mm. No, no, I took it from sedimentology. Oh, okay. Yeah, just that's, that's the sieves that we, we worked with when we were growing up. In our, so that's, sometimes you just have to start somewhere. So those aren't, I don't know about that. Maybe you would know about more of the plankton stuff, yeah. My question actually would be, sure. does your size classification reflect uh, the function in the environment of all these nanoplastics have more uh, effect, uh, good, better, or different than accurately? I think that's the big question. Um, the, the whole plastics research and study and excitement about that, that citizens have really become involved with is the macro side. Seeing the dead chicks with all the plastic cigarette lighters, right? Like, that's where people got really emotional about it and the, the poor um, strapping things over um, uh, mammals and that, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's where I think the compassion came from and the, the, the demand from the public to really understand the plastic pollution. But I don't think that those same mechanisms that are harming macroorganisms are the same that are harming, um, you know, um, yeah, plankton, yeah, plankton, even fish, and even probably whales. It's probably very different. But that's really active research, and people are really trying to support some of those hypotheses. It's just not what I do. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Geographically, mm -hmm. they raise a lot in time, um, but they're pretty similar. So we didn't expect anything different in Missouri compared to Tom in Dakota County or Arlington or Arlington County. Right? Yeah, and I sample way down the Olympia area and stuff. But, you know, I don't have, um, the, the extent of the sampling, again, is on ships of opportunity. It's very random. So I, don't, I haven't done a study that was specifically looking for geographics. It's just, it was my randomly, I was just on a boat. Um, I, I am partnering with folks in the Georgia Strait now, and so they're going to get their grad students over in um, Sydney to do some work, you know, just to collect more samples and more real extent. But, yeah, I don't see that there's a change. And just looking at the mass per solids within all of the samples I've taken since 2008. Yeah. Yeah. So correct. <laughs> yes. Because I think that we can see cause and effect, right? We can figure out if we're, you know, the source. So if I compare, if I compare beach monitoring to the outer coast, it's very different than we see within the coast or within the Puget Sound. And you know, up here, you guys are probably know it's all it's all Canadian trash, right? <laughs> like you can clean up a beach, you know, and it's you know I love Canadians. They they paid my my salary this summer, but um, but yeah, because you know it's just water does flow. But we're just we just need to see what the impacts are, and I think. Collecting data is really important to see, you know, is it worth us going out there cleaning beaches every day? Um, and, and that, the, the type of plastics that you're getting off of beaches typically is more macro, but if you start digging down there, I bet you're going to find a couple nurdles. Yeah, and that's kind of sad, but true. So the uh, beach cleanups and the other cleanup efforts that we have for plastics, uh, this goes into landfills or is it recycled or, yeah, how's it kept from getting back out? Oh, you know what's kind of cool is uh, the surf rider folks up in, I just, you know, hung out with them a couple months, or last month. Um, the surf riders, they actually, in Vancouver, the city of, they actually are taking all the plastics that they collected, and they're bringing it to a manufacturing plant, and they make little cup holders for makeup that is, 
you know, water soluble makeup. I'm like, why bother? But th so there, there are companies that are refurbishing this plastic. Now, for what I do, it, it sits in my office, <laughs> or my lab, <laughs> and it's I got lots of bags of that stuff. But for the most part, it goes into the the landfill. But it's at least it's not on the beach, right? We've tried that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Anything else? It's a long morning. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Anything? Yeah, shoot. Is anybody looking at the effect on shellfish eaters? Most definitely. Yeah, and so the shellfish folks, they call me all the time like, how is it affecting shellfish? I'm like, that's not my, that's not my purview of, of research. But yes, and especially in the Puget Sound because we're finding more and more plastics. And, and even in the fisheries, we're finding plastics. And even the exported fish, we have to clean out, make sure they're cleaned out because of the um, new demands for our exports. So yeah, people are looking at that. And uh, UPS, University of Puget Sound, um, Peter Hodum's students are working on that stuff very minimally, but, but really looking at that. Yep. England, is they're doing some great stuff. Thompson, that, his group, yeah. Awesome. Did I bore you guys to death? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll be around for, until later, so if you guys have more questions. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.